Good evening. Welcome to episode number seven of the Hope for Healing video podcast. I'm Dr. John Strax. I'm joining you from my office in Chicago and here this evening with my friend and colleague, Dr. Dan Ratner, who's a mind-body medicine psychotherapist in Cleveland. Hope for Healing is a joint effort between me and the Curable app, which most of you are familiar with. And for those of you who don't know one or the other, I'm a physician who's got a mind-body medicine practice in the Chicago area focused on the reduction and elimination of physical symptoms using mind-body medicine methods. Curable is an amazing app focused on the same goal. We've been working together since their inception about five years ago. We started this series at the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic as we both thought about what we could do to help support people using these methods during this difficult time. So before I introduce Dan and we get started, I just want to go over a couple of items. So first of all, Dan and I will be discussing mind-body medicine for about 45, maybe 60 minutes, and then we'll spend a little bit of time taking questions at the end. We'll sign off at about 20 past the hour, uh, which will be, uh, sorry, we'll sign off about 5.50 in Chicago, 6.50 in New York. Um, our friends at Cur Curable will collate those questions for us and deliver us to deliver them for us during the question and answer. And so if you have questions at any point during this broadcast, go ahead and either type them into the chat box in Zoom, if you're watching here with us on Zoom, or into the chat on the Facebook feed, if you're joining us on Facebook Live. Curable's monitoring those questions and they will forward them to us, we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Secondly, and I'll go over this again at the end, but I want everybody to know that we've been able to expand our telehealth practice significantly during COVID-19, and we're working to sustain that indefinitely even after the pandemic ends. So no matter where you are, if you are feeling stuck with your symptoms and would like to talk with me directly, feel free to reach out to my office at drstrax.com and my staff can give you details about uh, an individual consultation with me. And lastly, just a minute talking about terminology. So many of you know what we're talking about is mind-body medicine, which to me means that we can express in our body what's going on in our mind or in our lives. I think that's universal. I don't think that's bad and it only becomes quote bad if you enter a medical system that doesn't understand this and assumes that all physical symptoms are physical in origin. I think humans have always expressed their lives in their bodies and likely always will. And so our goal is to help you understand that and learn what to do about it so that it's no longer physically uncomfortable or painful for you. Both Dan and I learned about this concept initially from a physician named Dr. John Sarno, who many of you have probably heard of as well. Dr. Sarno was a physiatrist in New York City in the 1960s, who really understood that connection between mind and body and was one of the first to popularize that work. He called it tension myositis syndrome or TMS, which is a term that both Dan and I have used for years. We now have a much better understanding of this whole concept and we preferentially use the term mind-body medicine. Occasionally though, you'll hear us slip and call it TMS. No matter what we call it, we're referring to the same concept that what happens in our lives shows up in our bodies, which doesn't make us bad or sick. It just makes us human. So with that, I'm gonna introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Dan Ratner. Dan has a doctorate in psychology from Widener University, was initially a staff member and a training director at Fordham University's Counseling Center in New York City. In 2007, he set up a private psychotherapy practice in New York, where he practiced for many years until moving back to his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, where he currently lives with his family and practices psychotherapy. After dealing with a multi-year course of his own chronic back pain, which he'll tell us about soon, Dan developed out a portion of his practice to treat chronic pain from this mind-body perspective. Since that time, he's been one of the most foremost mind-body medicine psychotherapists in the country, actively working to strengthen his psychological treatments of pain and other symptoms, both in speed and effectiveness. He's also committed to raising awareness about this form of treatment for physical symptoms. To do that, he's worked in a variety of media settings, including both TV and comedy, is working on a new podcast called Crushing Doubt, and as well as, well as working on a book about mind-body medicine. 
He's graciously agreed to donate his time during his vacation with me here tonight on this episode to talk about his own personal experience and his experience as a psychotherapist working with clients to help them end their battle with chronic pain and other symptoms. Dan, welcome to Hope for Healing. That was the nicest introduction I think I've ever had. Including Excellent. The wedding. I mean, no, no offense to my wedding, but that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I am super excited for you to be here with me tonight. And we are just getting started and I'm gonna start with a detour. Who knew? That's but awesome. when you and I first talked, I think we we're both struck by the similarities in both our journeys and our career. And so many of the people listening have heard my podcast where I talk about how I learned about mind-body medicine way back in 1998 after a year of chronic pain. In a few minutes, you're gonna talk about your journey with that, which also started, I think, in your late 20s. But before we get there, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what happened before any of that happened. And so I graduated from college in 1991 and worked for the next six years doing social work type work in the Chicago area, working with disadvantaged youths on the south and west sides of Chicago. You graduated in 1995 and moved to Los Angeles to work for Teach for America is a program that takes recent college graduates and puts them into underserved school system and trains them to be teachers. And so um, struck by that similarity, because I know that the experience really still influences the work that I does. What was it like to be in Teach for America back in the mid 90s? Oh boy, uh, we could do a whole podcast on that. I will try to sum it up. But I, you know, it's interesting because as we talk about TMS, one of the things I'm thinking about yeah. is I can hear our trajectory. And, yeah. and it's not an accident that two people who went to try to help a bunch of people ended up with TMS and discovering this and then helping people in that manner. And we'll, we'll get into that more. And I'm sure you've talked about that uh, extensively in all kinds of, of settings. But I mean, I'll, it, it was a, just a life-changing experience and I knew it would be. And that's, that's kind of why I did it. Um, there were many reasons. I, I, you know, I went to Shaker Heights High School, which is where I'm from. And it is 50% African American, and they work really hard on racial issues. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that persist, and I think we're really seeing it in society today. Why? Um, especially, I think white culture hasn't really heard uh, what, what's happening. And I, it's, it's always been my mission to hear the people who are saying they're not being heard because we must be missing something. Right. So when I had the opportunity, you know, when I graduated college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> Um, I, I thought I might want to go into psych psychology. It's not a surprise that I ended up doing that, but I also had always loved little kids and I was very passionate about uh, race relations. And I just thought, well, this is a chance to have an adventure. And I signed on and it, it felt a little, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to say this for people who've actually been to the army, but it, to me, it felt like I was going to the army. Uh, um, I didn't know what to expect. I knew that I was in for one of the challenges of a lifetime. And it was that, but it also helped me to grow and to feel much more powerful in my ability to manage things. And that's, that's part of what I wanted to get out of it. You know, I had already been in years of therapy and I wanted something that would challenge me and help me feel that, uh, I, forgive the landscaping. Uh, I'm actually <laughs> in East Hampton, New York, where they just do landscaping all day, every day. Of so they did. <clears throat> that, that will continue long after the podcast. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you know, learn about me and, and challenge me and grow. And that I did. The first year was the, one of the hardest years of my life. Um, mm -hmm. for, for you teachers out there, I think it's the hardest job I've ever done. I think teachers are underpaid severely. That's no secret, but it's really weird when you think about it because these people are taking care of the kids. And it's part of what led me to psychology because as I was taking care of these kids, I, wow, that landscaping is really loud. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I can barely loud. hear it. So <laughs> you are all good. <laughs> you are all good. That's hilarious. Um, what I found is I wasn't, you know, I was helping the kids to have a good situation in the classroom, at least the second year. The first year I really had had challenges. But then they'd go home to these situations that were really tough. 
and I had been in therapy for a long time and benefited from it. And, and that's when I decided to, to go there. So I, I tried to sum it up that way, but. Yeah. It's funny that you, that you talk about that with the first year in teaching. And so I had some friends here in Chicago who did a very similar program locally. So essentially a local teach for America and they got put into the schools. And my friend said he finished his first year and he went down to the store and he bought himself a Subway sandwich and a six pack of beer. And he walked out of the store and he said, somebody on the street asked him for a dollar. And he said, buddy, like I just finished my first year of teaching, we're gonna celebrate. And so he split a sandwich with this guy and gave him a beer and they sat there and ate and drank. And that was how he celebrated his first year of teaching. Um, I'm sure that you bring some of those experiences into your psychotherapy work is there anything for you, and I can share some thoughts from me, but anything for you that stands out, that things that you take from those couple of years that you were teaching and apply still to the work that you do now? Well, it's a really great question. I, I would actually say I apply it even more to parenting than I do to uh, my, my psychology practice, but there's a lot of stuff about autonomy and boundaries and helping people believe in themselves because when, when my kids were uh, the, the first and not my kids, but my, my kids in the classroom, the first year, they were just walking all over me. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to control them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about a, a 23 year old white male coming into Compton and trying to control, it's just not a great setup um, for, for obvious reasons, but it also just wasn't working. And what I found is that everybody has a relationship with themselves these kids have a relationship with themselves. If you, if you help them feel good about themselves and the autonomy they have, you'll do better. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I learned there. Yeah. I, um, you know, I spent probably six years, I was in uh, two years doing like after school programs and drug prevention work and then four years in child welfare, working with uh, teenage state wards. And I think what I remember most about or what I take most is that like I learned from these kids just these horrific stories. Like one kid told me one time how he, um, what did he do? He went and sold drugs when he was like 11 yeah. on Christmas Eve to buy presents for his kids because his mother wasn't there. I mean, just like stories that you wouldn't believe, but but I've heard those stories. And so now what people say, well, I can listen, I can sit, and I can hear those stories that people tell me and they don't, they don't phase me. I love they that don't you scare that. me. Right, it, we, have to, we have to be able to put our, ourselves aside and really hear. And you know, that, that's endemic to good therapy, but it's also, it's incredibly important to the work of TMS because I have found increasingly that when I think about it, the people, sorry, I just slipped and said TMS. There you go. First yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. In mind-body work, um, I find that the amount of trauma people have suffered mm -hmm. is tremendous. And a lot of times, like me, it's not something they label trauma. In right. fact, they're very uncomfortable with that. I was. Um, I didn't like the idea that I had been traumatized. I liked, the, I liked the story that I had some really difficult stuff, but I rose above it. What I've learned is they're not mutually exclusive. I, I did both, but I had to let in that actually this stuff hurt more than I realized. And yeah. that helped me to be able to hear the other people. So yeah, I, I think our experiences, I can imagine the things that you heard about. Yeah. It was staggering to compare my life to theirs. Mm -hmm. And there were, ways, there were ways in which I had a lot more overlap than you'd think, and then ways that were, I had just no overlap whatsoever. Yeah. It was really fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, so I want to hear about your experience with back pain. I also, I just got a message that people are having a little bit of trouble hearing you. And so if there's any way to bring your computer a little bit closer to you. Um, really close if you want. <laughs> Hold on. Perfect. I'm going to open up my preferences and make sure it's loud enough as well. All right. That sounds good. And mm, how about now? That's actually much better. Aha. All right. I turned the okay. landscaping down and me up. Excellent. Excellent. Ultimately. So next, next time we do this, we know not to do it from East Hampton. Like exactly. that's what we have learned today. So anyway, so like I said, I had suffered from, uh, from essentially a year of pain that nobody could understand, but you had 
like eight years of pain. And so tell me, tell me what happened and what that was like. Yeah, I mean, there's no event other than having my kids that changed me uh, more than that experience. And I, I never would have guessed it. I mean, I, I felt it changed me for the worse for a long time, but I, I didn't guess that I would get anywhere with it. Um, so it began as a little twinge in my back, you know, bending over to tie my shoes. And I didn't think that much of it, but I have to say, I, I was like, uh-oh, I've heard about people with back pain. And that moment of worry is really important, you know, because I have a, a, a part of my personality that can be prone to worry. And I think that's one of the factors that can really set you down a path towards TMS. And I, it just got worse and worse. And I was thinking, what is this? Where, where did this come from? And that's one of the hard, hard parts about the experience. Um, I don't know what you experienced, John, about the level of confusion you had about what was going on. Um, I am happy to hear you, you, you got out of it in a year because. I did, but I would say during that year, like it was all I could think about. It was all I could talk about. Like it totally dominated my existence and nobody, nobody, everybody thought maybe they knew, but nobody knew what it yeah. was until it's, I figured out very, what it was. It's a very lonely, scary, confusing experience. And I would wake up in the morning and the very first thought I had was, how's my back? And I would go to sleep at night and the last experience I would have was, How, how's my back? I would wake up in the middle of the night. It got worse and worse until I had these absolutely gut-wrenching spasms multiple times a night. I didn't sleep through the night for eight years. Uh, there were, t well, I shouldn't say that actually, there were times within that period that I got the spasms under control enough to sleep through the night. But, and then you start to get tired and you think, well, how am I, how am I supposed to heal when I'm not even sleeping? Every, everything you're hearing about is feeding, just fear, fear, fear. And it's also very lonely because even the people who care about you, they can't envision it. I, I'm sure that sufferers have had this experience when, they, when somebody has back pain, they, they come to them and say, is this what it's like? I didn't know. And you're like, yeah, yeah. it's that bad. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the people who are supposed to be taking care of you, right? Medical professionals and like, and, and this, people tell me this all the time, they kind of make it worse. Uh, that certainly was the case for me. I, you know, I often, I often like to put in the disclaimer that I think doctors are great for lots of things. I don't think, and I, I think they would, admit this, they have not had success with chronic pain. Um, I think it was in 2017, the American College of Physicians released a statement basically telling patients, go to chiropractors, acupuncturists, go to alternative healers because we do not know how to handle this. And this was all coming from studies that were showing that whatever structural issues they were diagnosing didn't prove to have a correlation with the pain. Um, you know, there's the Jensen study and there's t tons of studies that we can tell people to, to look up, but they all show that herniated discs don't cause back pain, arthritis surprise. This all blew my mind, but I didn't know anything about this during this eight year journey, nothing. And so I went to doctors thinking, well, they're the ones who have solved the problems before. And I was really disappointed in what had happened in medicine. And I, I just didn't, I didn't, I guess I hadn't been to a doctor I mean, I went for checkups, but I hadn't been for anything major. Yeah, you were in your late 20s, early 30s. There's no reason that you would have needed I was to go, 20, at least most people. Yeah, yeah I was 28 when, this, when the onset happened. Now, my father died when he was 29 years old. And that, that thought was not lost on me either when I was 28. But I couldn't reconcile it. I was like, yeah, okay. So, okay, maybe it's you know, in my head, which everybody hates that term for a reason took me all this time, you know, until I discovered Sarno and sorted it out that it's not in your head, it's from your head, but it is real in your body. Whatever's happening in your body is real. And in fact, some people say to me, how is it possible this hurts this much? And I always say, the fact that it hurts that much tells me it is a mind body issue. Yeah. I've never had pain like this. It was uh, mind numbing. I took, I was taking four Advil three times a day and I knew that wasn't good for me. And, but I just didn't know what to do. Uh, I couldn't sit in a chair for more than maybe 30 seconds without getting so stiff that when I would get up, it would spasm. And so I, I, had, you know, I was in grad school at the time. 
I was seeing patients and I'd finish a session and I'd know what was coming. And I, and I, I and this is really important, I think, because I didn't want to show that vulnerability to my patients. I felt like it somehow disqualified me. So I'd get up and just be like, you know, I, but I wouldn't show it on my mouth. I, I'm sure I was able to hide it, but I felt damaged mm -hmm. inside. Um, I felt like a 95 year old. And I, and I would say that, and I, 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 I felt the loneliness and the, and the hopelessness of it. So when I went to the doctor the first time, I asked this question, um, and I really want to encourage everybody out there to think about the questions they ask, because you're giving someone else power to answer. And I, I understand why you would, but I want, this is one of the reasons I'm so vocal about this kind of stuff. I want there to be resources where people can go to places where they're not going to get damaged by the answer to their questions. I asked this doctor, so am I going to have back pain for the rest of my life? And she literally, this was her answer, probably. And she said it just like that. So in, I'm writing a book on this and I call her Dr. Probably. Um, uh, certain people do get skewered in that book as, as, they, as they should, because you don't have to be gleeful about it. If you don't know, um, you know, you can say, look, we're, we're still trying to understand this. Medicine's having problems with it. Bedside manner has gone way down the tubes uh, in medicine and not all of it's doctor's faults. You know, they're swamped with paperwork and uh, bad dynamics going on, but I, th I think we need to work together uh, to get medicine in a good place with this. And it's the overlap between psychology and medicine that, that's going to be important. Anyways. And yeah, and part of the language that I'll use with people is I'll say, like, there is a difference between acute pain and chronic pain, so much so that I sort of wish that they had different names, like cancer and an infection. And if you have acute pain, right, if you break your arm, like if you leave and tonight and you trip and break your arm, I don't want you to call me and try to meditate through it. I want you to go to the emergency room and get it x-rayed and set. And the pain that you would have if that happened is really important. And it implies that you need a medical solution to a medical problem. It turns out that chronic pain is not a medical problem in that way. It's not our body's way of saying that there's damage that happened in the body and we need to get a medical opinion. On right. it. What I oftentimes observe and say is that the pain that we feel points to the source of the issue, but the source of the issue isn't usually in the body. And because that it's not a medical problem. And so when we go to medical doctors with a non-medical problem, at best, they get confused. At worst, they get defensive or sometimes mean. And, and what I said to you, I think the other day, which I say also is like, uh, probably is shorthand for, this is very uncomfortable for me because I'm not sure what to do. And nobody told me in my training what to do if I don't know how to help somebody. And so I'm just gonna like pretend it doesn't. I, I really liked when you said that the other day, was, uh, you know, John and I have talked at various points and, and you know, you're pointing out that the doctor has vulnerability too. They, they're a lot of, I mean, most of them are, are trying to help but when they don't know what to do, it leaves them in a, in a real quandary. And, and the, the patient, meanwhile, uh, it's getting better now and we're, we're working at this, but the patient is generally like I was. Uh, I had no idea about this stuff. I went through all of the different paths. I, I, I went to the doctor. She eventually referred me to a physical therapist. He was working with me, said he knew what was gonna go on. I heard this time and again, I know what's happening. And then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And then they'd be scratching their heads. And I was like, how is it possible that I have a condition that leaves every expert scratching their heads about their area of expertise? I, I just, it wasn't making sense. And this is one thing I loved about reading Sarno and why it worked is finally it made sense, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. I've had, had a long time to get there. Um, I'll try to, I'll try to keep it relatively short, but I got an MRI. It showed maybe like maybe a slight disc bulge or something like that. But at the time I was like, do I have a tumor? You know, because I can tell you for sure, this was physical. It was real. My, I had this muscle in my back that I called the eel muscle that would spasm, but it was also so tight. It was like a metal pole. I mean, it's all real and you know, it's real. There's no denying it. So yeah. I'm going through these different things and, and 
So I went to the MRI to get the MRI done. Then I went to a back specialist, like top of the line person who's supposed to know the most. And I was the most shocked by this. The higher up the chain I went, the less they knew. And here's why, at least in, in my opinion. When you become very specialized, you, you're looking at, I mean, you, you had hand pain. You could have ended up in a hand surgeon's office that was- Which I did, which yeah, I did. Yeah. And they're going to talk to you only about the hand. But I mean, then you're really missing the boat. You're not, you're not looping in the mind at all. We always have to be looping in the mind. Um, I do agree with you. And I always say this. I don't work with anybody on mind body issues until they have been checked out by a medical doctor. Because the worst thing I could do is say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a mind body issue. And then they have a heart issue or, you know, something that is going to compromise their internal organs or, you know. And doctors, we can really rely on pretty well for life and death stuff. And so they, they can clear people uh, of things. A lot of times people are saying, oh, do I need to get diagnosed by a TMS doctor? It's certainly not a bad idea. And, you know, Dr. Strax is, is top of the line. Go, go, go see him. But I also think if you've been to see 10 different doctors and they're like, we can't figure out what it is, then you have a mind body issue. Um, I totally agree with that. And, you know, I say frequently, like as a physician, it's, it would be quite poor form for me to tell somebody that there's nothing wrong when there's something seriously wrong. And, and other physicians clearly feel the same way. Like that's one of the good parts of our training is we get a lot of training on, is this person really sick or is this person not really sick? And sometimes like that's the best we can do. We can say like, this seems really bad or this doesn't seem really bad, but physicians are good yeah. at that. And so I agree with you that if you've seen eight, 10, 15 different people who have all said either like, nobody can agree on what's wrong or nobody can come up with anything that's wrong. That that's a pretty good indication that, that nothing has been missed. Yeah. And I also, mind body issues are so prevalent. We all have them. It's part of the human condition. Uh, now that doesn't mean everybody has eight years of chronic back pain every day. That, that clearly was not the case. Um, but I ran into a dead end with medicine. And so, you know, at, at some point I was talking to a colleague while I was at Fordham, and she said she had had back pain. And I'm sure chronic pain sufferers will, will really identify with this. I heard that past tense. We, we hone in on these very little words. She said, I had had back pain. And I was like, what? what? What does this mean? So I asked her, what did you do? She said she went to a chiropractor. So I said, okay, um, you know, uh, fine. I, I've heard they can sometimes help. So I got her recommendation for a chiropractor. And this guy was great. Um, his name is Dr. Alex Einhorn. He's in, uh, he's in Manhattan and he's one of my favorite people. Uh, and he's the one who ultimately introduced me to Sarno. He did it a little bit, a little bit um, cautiously because I think he, he doesn't believe in it nearly as far as I go now, but he really helped me. And he also helped me with, I mean, when he started adjusting me, I started spasming even worse. So this was one of the worst experiences in my entire life. I, I felt no one could get it. I felt my life was ruined. I had to stop playing basketball, which was my favorite sport. I had played almost every day for years and years. And I just thought, I guess people just, some people get old faster. And when I think about it now, it's, it's, it's funny because I think some people feel older faster if they've been through a lot uh, emotionally. But yeah, and you were like 35, 34 years old. Yeah, um, but this chiropractor helped me in a, in a number of ways. One of the ways is that he was very confident that he could help me, but he could admit when he wasn't understanding it or he was wrong. And that, that said to me, I, okay, I can actually trust this guy. Cause he said, I, I think I know what's wrong. He took an x-ray and he came back and he was like, nope. And I was like, ah, okay, here is a scientist, which is really interesting. Cause you know, chiropractors are sometimes maligned as not being scientific. I think that all of these different, um, different kinds of professionals and practices, they're going to have some good scientists and they're going to have some that aren't. And that's true in, in, with MDs too. Uh, in fact, all these studies that we cite, uh, Howard Schubiner talks about all these uh, studies in such a great way. They're from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is not fringe medicine. Um, I say this all the time. It's, it's science and logic. It's not, it's, and Sarno says what, what you, what you need is not a leap of faith. You need a leap of understanding. I love yeah. that quote. That's great. And, but I still wasn't there yet. 
And I had to work through a long process with the chiropractor where he got me off of Advil like I was a heroin junkie. And I was like, I don't understand why when I reduce the, the dose, it, it ends up being the same. So he knew it would. I didn't understand it. I think he understood there was some kind of mind-body process. I don't know how he understood it exactly. But he, we stopped the spasms maybe about two and a half years after they had started. And even that was just such a blessing. I was like, that, that means I can live a relatively normal life. But, but I was still pretty defeated and I was confused. And I was, I was um, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, but I was very disillusioned during that time. And, and that's what it does. It takes over your whole experience. And uh, so when he introduced me to Sarno, I, I, I was skeptical. I was like, I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm at the bottom of the barrel. You're telling me to read a book and that's somehow supposed to fix my back. I, oh. And you were already a psychotherapist at this point, right? It exactly. wasn't like you weren't in the, the field no, of the I mind. Grew, I grew up in a family of like psychoanalysts and psychotherapists. I had been a therapist for how long? Uh, at that point, 10 years. And I, even me, I was like, really? Uh, but it helped that Dr. Sarno was an MD. Uh, you know, I say this all the time. I, I'm a psychologist. I, I happen to know a lot about it now from having done the research, but it really helps me to know there are MDs who totally agree with me because that's not my field. So I started reading Sarno. Uh, and, it, and really when I started to get out of it was when I actually paired an emotional event with my pain. Uh, this happened when I was seeing a, a therapist who I actually had a lot of conflict with, which I n had never had with any therapist, very weird situation. And as stubborn and, and persistent as I am, I was like, I'm going to fix this relationship. <laughs> and I tried. And it was when he was going on vacation that my back started hurting. Just, it was the day that it happened. It was, it was to the minute that that session ended pretty much. And I was like, I can't deny it. I thought I was happy he was going on vacation, but clearly I'm not. And when, when you start to pair those things, you can start to look at it. And I had read Mind Over Back Pain, his, uh, Sarno's first book. Then I, I jumped to The Divided Mind, which is a great book um, for people who really want to know the ins and outs of this. And I wanted to know everything. And, uh, and by the way, John, tell me if I'm taking too long on any particular part of the story. Uh, I think a lot of times pain sufferers really like to hear the specific story because it gives them hope when they hear just how bad it was for somebody else and they got out of it. That's why I'm going into detail, but tell me to be quiet if it's, if it's no, too no, much. Keep going. Um, so the next time this therapist went away, I got back pain again. And I was like, there's no doubt. That second time is so confirming. And I contacted Eric Sherman, who had uh, worked with Sarno. And I was like, he's a, he's a psychotherapist in New York city. One of the, like, in my mind, the greatest psychotherapists of all time. He's, he, and he's a great, he's a great guy. And he was, he was very good to me, but it was interesting. Cause I went thinking, okay, I need a specialist who can work with this Sarno stuff. And, and he is a specialist, but what I found increasingly, and this is how I ended up developing the kind of practice that I have is most people don't treat mind body issues with a short-term model they basically treat it as therapy, but they're mind body informed. And that's extremely valuable, but it can be limiting in certain ways. And one of the ways that it can be limiting is I went to see Eric and he, from a psychological perspective, did the appropriate thing and said, well, listen, you're in a treatment relationship. I don't want to undermine that relationship. So I really can't see you. And I was like, I'm at a dead end. Nobody can help. Even the people who can help me aren't in a position to help me, but I was, resourceful and, and, and Eric was very uh, generous about this particular thing that we ended up doing. I said to him, okay, can I use this session to ask you every question I've ever had about TMS? He said, yes. This is part of how I developed my short-term model and how I got better. I asked him, I, I'd probably say 250 questions in one, in one sitting, everything I could think of. Now, was it an he, hour or two hours, double session? It was an hour, but, and some of them were fast. Some of them were like, um, is this curable? Yes. You know, is, is, did I cause this myself? No. Uh, did it come from, can it come from other people who bother me? No, they can maybe exacerbate things, but this is a condition between you and yourself. 
I just went through all of it. And I got more out of that session. He may not even know this, but I got more out of that session uh, than almost anything. And it wasn't just what he said. It was my own experience of knowing what I needed. I needed the questions answered. And that's what I tell people and why, why short-term consultations can work with me. A huge part of the experience of mind-body issues that most people in my experience, even in this world of mind-body medicine, don't talk about enough is doubt. Now, this is my word for it. Some people have said, I, I need to think of it as fear or I need to think of it as confusion. Whatever the word is, that's okay. But the reason my podcast is going to be called Crushing Doubt is that the, the awareness of the emotions was part of the battle. But I had a lot of fear and confusion. I had so many questions. And I needed to get them all resolved. And when I did, I haven't had, I haven't had a spasm since uh, uh, 2011, I think, um, which was the time when I read Sarno. And I just started investigating all the ways that I could get better and better. I, and I would hit plateaus in my, in my own recovery. And I would think, what is happening here? Everything I developed was because of my personal experience. And it's one of the reasons I feel so comfortable talking about it. And one of the things that I really discovered is it changed the way I do therapy. And I think this is why a lot of people, therapists and doctors alike, are scared to look at this because it will change you. But that's not a bad thing. Um, so one of the ways it changed me. In therapy, we are taught, don't disclose much about yourself. You know, this is supposed to be about the patient, don't make it about you. I agree with that in principle. But what I found is that the disclosures I gave about my suffering were so relieving to the people. And they weren't, we weren't making the session about me. I wasn't, you know, boohooing and saying, oh, I remember this time that was so hard for me. I'm, I was giving them, it was like people who were crawling out of a desert looking for water. And I could tell. And it made me closer to the people that I work with. It made them trust me more. And uh, don't get me wrong, their self-disclosure should be used appropriately. Um, but I use it pretty liberally. Uh, and I find we don't get off track. People want to talk about what's going on for them. Yeah. They're not going to get off track on you. And I think that, you know, this idea that like, it's a one way street, like we should reveal nothing about ourselves. And, you know, I'm not a psychotherapist, even though sometimes I will play one on TV, but um, <laughs> like I'm a doctor. I understand. <laughs> and so it, like, I do think that like we can bring some of ourselves into the relationship and it's, it's healing as opposed to, to off-putting. And so I want to hear about kind of what you do in psychotherapy. I also want to hear the end. And so you started to get better after you read his book and you, um, you know, you had some plateaus and then at some point the pain was mostly gone or all gone. Okay. So, um, about, you know, when I read Mind Over Back Pain, it was still about two more months before I, I really got better, but it, it was, it was because I paired that emotion and, uh, physical pain that second time that was so so key. The first time was key, but the second time was maybe even more key because it was no fluke. Very clear. When I read The Divided Mind, I was actually out here. Um, and I had read The Divided Mind for about three days. And all of my back pain was gone during the day. I was able to do flips in the pool three days after still being essentially in the same condition. And that's the other thing is that seeing is believing. You, 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 you have to see it for yourself. You have to be convinced. Your mind has to believe it. And it's not a, it's not a belief system based on faith or, or wrong beliefs. It's all true. But even so, if you don't believe it, you're not going to get there. So I really, I got it. Between the session with Eric, which had happened probably like a week before that, and, and starting to read The Divided Mind and seeing that pairing, I was like, I can't believe it. This is all completely correct. And, you know, I was still actually having some, I had a couple spasms at night, I think, during that recovery, but I just kept thinking, well, look, if it got better from my, my changing my thinking, then that's what it is. I can't, I cannot heal a broken bone from my mind. If I can heal it from my mind, if I can change it from my mind, then it is from my mind. 
but real in the body. And I just started getting all of those things settled. Like the term psychosomatic, that's a term that most people bristle at or think is outdated or whatever. But mm -hmm. I've come to see, I, even I as a therapist had un misunderstood psychosomatic. I thought it did mean it comes from your head. No, psychosomatic means starts in your head, becomes real in the body. And I started to look at it. I mean, Sarno talks about this, that blushing is one of those examples. You have the emotion of embarrassment and your blood flow actually changes in the real body and goes up to your face. I started thinking about this. And I, I, when I started writing my book, it was probably about two years into writing this book that I suddenly realized that crying is psychosomatic. We have a sad emotion yeah. and our tear ducts change and actual tears come out. That, that yeah. is a real physical reaction from the mind. And we've got all kinds of these. We've got goosebumps. And so what started to eat away at me is why do we think little certain parts of the body apply, but others don't? That doesn't make sense to me. And I'm just allergic to things that don't make sense. It doesn't, I, I won't go with that. It's not good enough. Um, I had many doctors and practitioners who they're, they kind of got to a place where they were like, huh, I would never let it go at that. I, I just couldn't. I'm just like a dog with a bone. I mean, I, I have to know. And I knew I had to know to get better. So um, that all started to get better. And I just started to apply thinking. I, I started to apply science and logic, science and logic, just hammering away at it. And I think that's when I started to recognize that there's a doubt component. Um, one thing that was really interesting for me is I noticed that the spasms were 100% related to fear. Every single time I had a spasm, it was fear. So there was, there was a, spe a specificity to different symptoms. I also used to have like a little adrenaline rush down my right mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. If I get that adrenaline rush to this day, I'm feeling competitive. Mm -hmm. My body is telling me what I feel. <laughs> and so I just kept learning. And then I kept reading. And I, I, I read Molecules of Emotion by Candace Perk because I was like, Sarno talks about this. This, That book was so great at actually telling me what's really happening in the body. Yeah. And different people need different things, but I just, I kept working at it. I kept getting better and better. Eventually I developed a, an understanding of what happens when we get stuck at different plateaus and why, because that happened to me. I got about 80% better and then I just was kind of stuck there. And I was like, who are these people that like read the book and they're all better? <laughs> and I say this to people all the time. Those people are, first of all, they're likely to have some other symptoms later. Those aren't in the book. Um, people do have, I, I've worked with people who cured their back pain in three days. And then they come to me later with headaches or something else because your body is not going to stop talking. If you cured it by, if you cured it by understanding the basic Sarno stuff, but you haven't understand the depth of it, understood the depth of it, your body's going to start talking again. And nothing's been better for me than listening to my body. Yeah. We had um, a couple of episodes ago, we had a patient of mine, David Holmes, who was talking about how he first learned about it. He read Dr. Sarno's book. He got better. He's like, this is great. I love this. And then he like gave the book to his mother-in-law. And then six months later, like then it really happened. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And so, you know, people get better in three sentences in these books because like, that's what we need to do in order to get the interest about it. But real life people don't usually get better in three sentences mm -hmm. or three days. There's these various components to it and the plateaus and, and the doubt. And when I got better, this is in 1998, for years, I told the story, like I got on my bicycle and I rode my bicycle and I was better. And, and then like, after telling that story for like seven or eight years, I found the workbook that I kept in that time period. And like every page was like, I don't know, maybe should I go out to LA and see Dr. Schechter? Like, how do I know? Do I need to be examined? Like, it was just, it was months and months of doubt. Yeah, I, I, I love that you said that because I do think uh, people kind of can have amnesia about their own recovery. Um, it reminds me of what people say about uh, women and childbirth. I obviously no expert on that, although I've been in the room when my children were born, but we do, we do have a tendency to forget. And I probably have kind of forgotten my back pain in some way. It's one of the reasons I wrote it up so specifically. I wanted to remember every detail. And I think that um, 
it really is true that we, we have to we have to keep focused on the fact that we we were not sure. And it makes sense that nobody's sure. How, how could you be sure? Uh, when people say like, oh, you know, I, I don't I don't fully believe it and I, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm like, of course, you don't believe it. You just met me. And we're just talking. About I, give yourself time. You're, you're a scientist. Let's explore this. What makes sense and what doesn't? And it's really interesting because looking back on all the old theories that I used to hear, they, they make me laugh sometimes now. You know, people are like, oh, you know, we aren't meant to sit for long periods of time. Right. That too, one, much, too much work. Yeah. yeah. We're not supposed I'm to like, walk this much. I'm like, okay, our ancestors were cavemen, like <laughs> running away from woolly mammoths, but they can't sit for, for an hour. It just, evolution is a very helpful thinking process for me about what makes sense. So, so anyway, so I want to hear about, um, so at some point you started bringing this into your psychotherapy practice. And so I want to hear about the evolution of how that shifted to more yeah. of what you do now. Okay. So I, I remember the very first patient that I saw, obviously I can't divulge anything uh, specific, but she, she won't, I've talked to her about this already and gotten permission to, you know, give some little detail. She came to me with knee pain and I knew that knee pain shouldn't be any different than back pain. It's, it, you know, she had been to see doctors. She was describing things like it hurts less when I wear my magic shoes, you know, all, all of those little belief systems that we, we develop that are understandable. She had no information. And that's one thought I had when, when the chiropractor gave me Sarno, I was like, no one in my entire life knew about Sarno. And that's part of why I felt I have to dedicate my life to spreading the word about this. Some people call that proselytizing, but that's proselytizing is when you're spreading a belief that you don't actually know is true. So I don't actually think of it as proselytizing. I'm, I'm spreading the science. My bad. It, and it's in, no, but it's interesting to me how you and me and others, like it's, we were just tapped. Like we had this experience so that we could explain it. Yeah, and nothing, nothing made people. me believe. I mean, I, not to get all spiritual on, on people, but like I'm, I've never been particularly spiritual or religious, but that, that experience made me feel like, oh, I'm meant, I am meant for something. It just, it flowed, it fit. Really cool experience. Um, not at the time, but <laughs> as I got better. But when I saw this patient, I, I did, I knew that, that a doubt was very key for me and that I needed to address all of her questions and get her not doubting. And so I worked at it. And we got her significantly better in probably about a month. And again, once you help somebody get better from this, it, it starts to add to the belief system. It starts to build on itself. But it's very important about doubt because I had heard this over and over that people would say, well, actually, I heard it kind of later after this patient. Um, I had heard people came to me and said, I went to a doctor. They said they were 99% sure that it was TMS. And I know what they heard. They heard it's 1%, maybe not. not yeah. That is what they heard. And of course, that's what they heard because they're afraid and they don't have answers. It's just not 99% isn't good enough. And so I knew that. So I was working on 100%. I was confident she had been to see many, many doctors. So I wasn't worried about, you know, that she's got some serious knee issue and I'm going to get her into trouble with this. But she started getting better. And, and then what I discovered after having a couple of patients this way is that they all got better from the symptoms and then they became therapy patients. They had their whole emotional lives. Their symptoms were largely under control, but we would use the symptoms. I, I describe symptoms as kind of a, a waking dream. In therapy, we sometimes analyze dreams that give us uh, insights into the unconscious, but the body is doing it during waking life. So it's amazing. It's the best tool to make therapy go fast. So I'm dealing with a lot of things. I'm like, whoa, my, my therapy was going a lot slower than it will go now. Because I, I, when I would say, well, I would give an interpretation and it was so laser focused, not because I'm a genius, but because the body told me exactly what was going on. And they know when it's true most of the time. Um, so I just suddenly was, the therapies were all moving faster, but I also was finding, well, I have limited time. Uh, how am I going to help all these people? And I thought about what really helped me. And, you know, really, mainly, it was that one session with Eric with all of those questions. It was the readings I did. 
and it was my growing confidence in my own mind to find out what I needed to know. And just a quick question, I don't want to get you off track, but you were working with a therapist at the time. So this is a question I get all the time. Like, can people work with therapists who don't know about mind-body medicine and still have it be helpful? It's a great question. Um, I think the main, the main focus needs to be, is the relationship good? Because in a good relationship, that therapist is, should be willing to read a book by Sarno and become informed enough. The therapist I was working with, he wouldn't, wouldn't really read it. And I actually talked to Michael Galinsky, who uh, created and directed All the Rage. And he, he doesn't know this either, but he changed my life also. We were talking about the movie and, we were, and I was talking about my experience and how, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm working with a therapist who doesn't really believe in this. And he was like, how can you go to see a therapist that doesn't believe in this? And I took it with a grain of salt. I was like, I don't want to be a, a zealot. And, you know, this guy has helped in other ways. But I really thought about that. And I was like, I think he actually said, how can you go to see somebody who doesn't believe in the core values that you do? And I was like, that's true. That's really true. <laughs> and uh, probably about six months later, I, I decided to end that treatment. And then when I went to look for another therapist, I wouldn't go to see anybody who wasn't informed by mind body stuff. So, I mean, I highly recommend it, but I also don't want to tank good relationships. The, the thing about what I do though, and I love this, that I offer this because it's what I needed. You don't have to stop going to see your therapist if you want to come see me, because I'm like that consultant that I wanted Eric to be. Um, and that has allowed me to see lots more people and, and get more people relief, but it's also been so satisfying because I have, I mean, I've cured hundreds of people of things. A cure is a word that we use uh, cautiously because there's no cure for being human, but, um, right. but I've heal, gotten- Heal works I well did. too. Yeah, I've got chronic conditions under, under, uh, under wraps. And uh, remind me, John, that we should talk about acute versus chronic at some point. That is something I wanna make sure we get to. But um, I, I was able to work with these people and a lot of them I would cure in somewhere between one and four sessions. Um, I had a supervisee who I, I taught about this stuff and she had nine years of heartburn where she had to take medication every day. It was very bad. And we talked about it. We got, we, the body told me exactly what was going on. I, Cause I asked what was the timing of the symptoms and it, the timing of symptoms is, is exact. I have found, I don't know if you've found that John, but the body's so smart. <laughs> it, it's yeah. telling us everything. Yeah. And so I will say, like you just said that in between one and four sessions, so, you know, there's probably about 300 people listening at the moment and another you know, thousands will listen to this over the next month or so. Yep. 5,000 people just said to you, like, what can I do to do this in one to four sessions? Yeah. Okay. So this is great. So I, I, I really ended up developing a very structured model that was basically what would I have wished had been brought to me? And what I do is I, I collect some background information on their, their history so that we don't actually have to spend the time in session on, okay, what were your parents like? What was your relationship like? Because that, that stuff, I want that as background information that I can kind of thread the needle to get to the heart of, of uh, mind body matters. So what I do when they come to the session um, on top of, trying to make them feel comfortable with me and if they have any questions and you know the usual the usual stuff um i often tell them that you know i suffered from this myself and i'm happy to tell any part of the story that that they want to hear and so we can get to that um generally we've kind of talked that out through email before we even get there but i tell them to bring a piece of paper and a pen and i tell them to separate that into four columns um the first column is called emotions. And this is where I help them get their core emotional experiences articulated as they relate to their symptoms. So they might have an emotional experience that just doesn't seem that active in the symptoms and we don't end up writing it down. But I call this whole thing a TMS map. I, I want it to be a personalized TMS map. And one of the reasons I like this is they'll have it written down. I tell them when this is over, digitize this and then send it to me. So I have it also. And we hone this over time. If we're only gonna meet for one session, let's say they can only afford one session. 
I'll do that one session and then I'll do some email consults afterwards or something like that. But I try to get it articulated. What are your, what are your core emotional experiences? And these are big, big ticket items. It's not like I ordered a sandwich and I got the wrong sandwich and that gave me. Can, can you give a, an example of sort of what somebody's core emotion might be that would contribute to a sentence? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to use myself as an example, just as the first thought. Um, when that therapist went away, it felt like he didn't care about me. And I didn't have a father from the time I was six weeks old. So I was looking for father figures throughout my life. It hurt. You know, that's, that's a big item. Am I, am I valued by a father? Or uh, does anyone listen to me? Does anyone care if I'm hurt? You know, big things that apply to everything. Am I a failure? Is there something wrong with me? These are all good examples of the kind of thing we, we get articulated. And I start, you know, this list is helpful because we then can start to pair these themes with flare ups. They're like, I was standing in the kitchen and I was making dinner and my husband, you know, wasn't really noticing, uh, you know, and he, he's very busy, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then on my back started hurting and I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> were you possibly feeling unappreciated there? And could that, that fits with these themes? It, it's always things that fit with the, the deep past and things that you're seeing in the present. So we go through the emotions. Um, and, I, and I like what you're saying too about how like as a psychotherapist, it's so helpful for you to have the body to lean on because you get that insight about what she was feeling in a way that she can't articulate in words, but yeah. you're paying attention because you know, and so you can hear it clearly and then bring it out so that she can hear it too. It's amazing. Right. And it, it might've taken me two, three years to really understand that fully, but I just trust the body because I know. It's told me things. Then we move on to um, the second column, which is doubt. Um, and this is where I differ from a lot of my colleagues in that I really, really focus on it. I think it is, um, emotions are the key to acute symptoms, to upticks, to onset. But if something is lingering, doubt is the key. You have questions, you're not sure. Well, let me, let me say it this way. There's three levels of doubt that I've discovered. One is, is this TMS or is it something else? So we need to get that question answered. And there are many, there's thousands of questions that can be buried in that. Then there's, if it is TMS, is TMS curable? You know, or is it curable for, well, is TMS curable? Then there's the third question, which is even if, if uh, mind, body, <laughs> mind body issues are uh, curable, can I do it? Doubts about the self. So there's these three different levels and I know which ones to start looking in when they say, no, 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 I know it's TMS. Uh, I know that this can be cured. I know uh, I've even cured it, let's say 80%, but can I do it? And this brings me to the third column. The third column uh, tends to be confusing for everyone, including me, but I still think it's extremely useful. It's called power. And I look at the person's relationship with themselves in this column? Are they letting themselves be as powerful as they can be? Are they shying away from it in some way? And so that, that third level of doubt tends to flow over into the power column. Am I allowed to, is it safe to be powerful? Um, there's a lot more in that column. We can talk about it and maybe we'll leave that for questions. But the fourth, col the fourth column is called action steps. I always want to give people, what do I do? Because we all know that's what they want to know. You know, nobody wants to come to a session and talk about their feelings and then go home and be like, yeah, but what do I do? I still hurt. They really want to know. And because of my experience, I can, I can tell them some of those things. I'll give you an example. I could meet with somebody who's having neck pain, let's say, and they're like, yeah, uh, you know, it really hurts when I do this. And I say, okay, one of your action steps is don't test that neck. Don't keep checking. It's still going to hurt. That hurt's not going anywhere. You don't need to verify that it's there. Leave that alone. And the reason I do that is because if they're checking, it's reinforcing that it is only physical. It is physical, but they're, they're reinforcing some of the problems they're running into. And I say, instead of doing that, think about your emotional life. And they start thinking about their emotional life. If they do that for an hour, they lose track of the symptom and it just starts getting better. And I don't mean getting better like healing, but just 
the active pain centers are not firing so much. Okay. So that's the basic gist of, of what I do. In the first session, we get it as articulated as we can. In the second session, we get it articulated even more. In the third session, that's where we, if, if we get to that point, and I try to get there as early as I, if I only have two sessions with somebody because of cost or, or time or whatever, I'll sometimes move even faster towards this. But eventually I wanna get to, let's make sure you understand these, these four columns very well. And, you know, we go with a fine tooth comb and I never know what it's gonna be. I sometimes meet with somebody and the power column is everything. I sometimes meet with somebody and the emotion column is dominating. But I will, I will say, if there's one column that seems to dominate most of the time, it's doubts because there are so many questions. And, and so when you work on the doubt, is that what you're doing is sort of helping people articulate the questions they have and then either answering or helping them figure out how to answer? Yes. Those questions. Um, when I came to see Eric, I didn't need help articulating them because I had been over and over and over them in my mind. And that's just a strength of mine, but most people haven't articulated them that well. Um, I also had been to years of therapy. There were reasons why I could articulate it. You need to get the question out there. So I say, is your, is your question, you know, like sometimes people will be like, well, is it TMS? And we'll look at it. And really that's not what they're asking. They know it's TMS, but is it curable? That was the question they were asking. Um, and so sometimes the question isn't what you think it is. And we have to answer the, the question that actually is being asked inside. So I help them get them articulated. And then one thing that I think people like about working with me is I know, I know when I can be definitive. There are times where I'll say, well, I don't know yet. Let's keep, let's keep exploring. But there are other times where I'm totally definitive where they say like, is, is TMS curable? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Instantly. And they say, well, but, Sar Sarno says maybe only like 15 to 20% can accept the diagnosis. I love Sarno, but I, I also think everybody's got their limited perspective. And I think one of the things that he maybe wasn't getting there is 15 to 20% of the people that he was seeing could accept it in the form he was giving it. I love Sarno, uh, nothing against him at all, but I think that that's, I would say 15 to 20% of people probably reflects people who don't have a lot of doubt. So that's where you're getting that number from. A hundred percent of people can accept this. If you pose it scientifically, logically, and you resolve all their doubts, they will get better. Yeah, yeah. And that, that certainty is very important. I don't yeah. say 99% sure because I might as well say, oh, 50-50, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Right. And so I know that some people have questions. I want to get, so I want to get to people's questions in a second. Um, you had wanted to make a comment about acute versus chronic. Yeah, this is important. Um, I've come to see that in mind body issues, generally speaking, I have started to think of them in this way. You can either have an acute situation that leads to a, a, a flare up in a symptom and then it goes away. But a chronic condition I've come to see as Acute, 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 acute. You know, it's, it's so back to back that you couldn't see that it's chronic. And the reason that I explained it this way is what you do about that is very different than what you do about a chronic experience. It is chronic in that you have it every single moment. But if you are essentially renewing a subscription to pain second by second by second, then we can stop you renewing that subscription. And you can recognize, you can break that cycle at any moment, which is very different than you got a chronic condition like arthritis that you could do nothing about, which we know turns out it's a chronic condition that doesn't cause any pain. Right. It's totally right. incidental. But yeah. if you're seeing it as acute all the way along, then you know every single moment you have a chance to do something about mind body stuff. So I just wanted to say that it's important. And uh, I want to go back to the doubt question for a second because people will frequently say to me a version of what you just said, which is like, I'm 98% sure that this is TMS, but I've got that 2% of doubt. I honestly feel like, okay, I feel like that's okay. Um, but you're saying that you really do feel like people need to be 100% sure 
And I think one thing that happens is that people start to get down on themselves because they only believe it 98%. So we get back to this idea of I've failed, which, which like multiple, multiple people have told me this week in my office. And so you're saying that you want people to have no doubt, but you're also, I think, saying that you have a way for them to get there. Is that right? Yeah. And I think, so if somebody came to me and said, I've, I'm only 98% there and feels all ashamed about it, I would say to them, you haven't failed. We have failed you. Yeah. You know, the books yeah. we're writing have, have failed you. Yeah. Well, I haven't done enough yet. I believe that if you talk to any person and you deal with their mind and you help them get resolution in their mind, they will be fine. And so it's really a belief in people that makes me feel that you can get to 100% with anybody. Yeah. For some people, they need piles and piles of research. And I'll say, you know what? Go read Mind Over Medicine by Lisa Rankin. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but it's great for all these studies that show how much the mind affects things. Or Bernie Siegel's another one. Um, Norman Cousins' Anatomy of an Illness. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I have readings that I can assign to each type of doubt, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I just, I believe that every mind can be healed. And I believe that every mind can come to terms with itself. Yeah. And you're saying that if you still have 2% of doubt, great, let's do what we can. Yeah. I actually, I, I think doubt is a sign of, um, it's actually a sign of someone who's going to recover even more fully yeah. because it's the people who don't know they have doubt that could get bit later. Yeah. Um, the people who, who know they have doubt, great, you're, you're in great shape. I'm not afraid of any doubts, bring it. Let, let's, let's talk about what's making you not sure. I mean, otherwise we're just leaving the, the patient to feel alone and hopeless again. Right, right. So, all right, let's, um, let's take a few questions. Um, we have a little bit of time and um, so we've got a couple that are posted here. Let me read this. So I recently finished Curable Groups. I've not experienced much of a change yet, um, though, although that's what I expected since I've had TMS for over 40 years. Um, and so I don't know how if you're familiar with the, the Curable Groups. They're fantastic. They, 12 weeks, a variety of topics, great facilitators, great group support. And so question here, I think, is what would make it so that there wouldn't be much of a dent in their physical condition? And so part of that is what we've just been talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And when you've had something for 40 years, your doubt is likely to be even stronger. You know, and I asked, that was one of the questions I asked Eric, am I any worse off that I've had this for eight years than somebody who's had it for one? He said, no, not at all. Now, Obviously, I had to trust Eric enough, but he was a trusted source because Sarno had mentioned him and he was a therapist who understood things and his, his manner made me feel like I think this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. But um, I had to get these questions answered for myself. And so uh, in my experience, and I don't even want to say it in my experience because that will leave doubt. I will say more definitively, it doesn't matter how long you've had it. It is an acute subscription to pain and you've kept it for 40 years and that means that the system has failed you up to this point, but there is help. And you can get, you, a person could have this for 40 years and get better in one session. I'm not saying that's always gonna happen, mm -hmm. but I do believe if you, if you give yourself a good number of months at least to look at things in this way, you will, you'll get better. And you'll start to see, it starts to build on itself. Um, so there's another question here about writing and people sort of read Dr. Sarno's books or, or enter into this field in that way. Um, even Curable does focuses a lot on expressive writing. Is that something that you incorporate in your treatments with people? I don't know uh, the answer to this. So. No, that's a great question. You know, I know there's certain people who really swear by it, like, um, Nicole Sachs. I know, um, Dr. Nicole Sachs has her own podcast and she, I've never actually got to talk to her myself, but I, I assume I will at some point. Yes. Anyway. Um, 
And she talks about journaling. That, that's one of the ways that she has found to be incredibly helpful. And I think there's a lot of different parts that are filling in different places. The thing I like about doubt though, is it allows people, to, it, it allows us to fill in specific gaps. It allows us to go anywhere. Journaling is gonna work for some people. It's gonna work wonders for some people. Maybe they haven't had a chance to interact with themselves in that way and that's a calm way to do it or an organizing way to do it or it helps them get it articulated. But every time I work with somebody, I'm working with an individual mind. And sometimes, I actually just made this recommendation to somebody recently. They said, well, I've been journaling, but it doesn't seem to help. In fact, it makes it worse. That can happen. And nothing against people who, who do journaling, and, and, um, but we're working with individual minds. Some people, their pain gets worse because they're obsessing about it. They keep thinking about it and they're not gonna get free of it. So in the book I'm writing, in the chapter on doubt, there's basically all these different strategies that'll work for some people and some not at all. Um, one thing I was struck by uh, in my own recovery is when I resumed normal physical activity, that was a bigger deal than I thought it was going to be. I just thought Sarna was saying you're safe to resume normal activity. What I didn't know is resuming normal activity convinced me that I was fine. It, it made me leap forward past a plateau. Mm -hmm. So I was working with a, a guy who... Um, basically had had always resolved his mind body issues by resuming normal activity and then one time it wasn't working and he got panicked so we need multiple ways to solve multiple problems and it has to be individualized to the to the that individual human mind but the tms map i develop allows us to get there fast so with this particular guy sorry i'll just say this one last okay. thing we realized it was attentional he was paying too much attention to the symptoms Journaling sometimes will make people pay too much attention when, when we actually want to help you let it go. Yeah, there are interesting brain imaging studies that say that if you activate that area of attention, you will make pain signals worse. Absolutely. Well, so if, it's you one of the, it, if you think yeah. about a time you were angry and you think about it, you, your body can change. Yeah. You're right back in it, yeah. depending on how bad it is. Yeah. It, um, with the journal writing, it's interesting that you said that about people and making people worse. I hear that regularly as well. Almost always, if somebody tells me that the journal writing is making it worse or sometimes like it's making them anxious or having panic attacks, I say, what are you writing about? And they say, I'm writing about how bad I am at this or how bad I am in general or That's how guilty I feel. And, um, and like I've learned that we can't, we can't do that. Like if we're journal writing and we're attacking ourselves, oh. we have to stop. That's brilliant. I hadn't even thought of that, but, and I keep learning all the time, but you just made me realize that you can't answer the question, is journaling helpful when you don't even know what does journaling mean for that person? And yeah. you know, I'm sure somebody who thinks about journaling uh, often would know some stuff about this, but you're right. If journaling means I'm berating myself for an yeah. hour writing, yeah. it's not yeah. going to help. No, it's not going to help. And, and at this point, like if I hear that that's going on, I say like you have to either change the journal writing and, and focus it outward or you have to stop because I know it's not going to be helpful. That's great. This next question says, so I understand that my brain perceives negative emotions as dangerous, but what I don't get is what's the brain's motive for creating pain? Is it the result of activating the autonomic nervous system in response to stress, which causes the reaction such as tension or oxygen deprivation, or is the brain causing pain to distract from the emotions it perceives as dangerous? I love this question. Uh, I love this yeah. question. It's at, the, it's at the heart of the matter of, yeah. of, of mind-body work because Sarno poses it as a distraction. Right. One, one of the things that I write about in my book is it is, it is a distraction sometimes. But usually anything that the mind and body are doing, it's doing for multiple reasons. So one of the things I've found is it's a distraction, but it is also a communication. So essentially, here's a way to think about it. A symptom is a way of expressing the ambivalence about knowing. It's not just that you don't want to know. It's also that you do want to know. And the way that you can do it is to send an encoded message. So what I do is I simply translate the encoded message, which is just like laying out there right in the open. And it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how different the work is when you have that at your disposal. I think every therapist should have this as part of what they do. And I think every doctor should be trained in the overlap. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, but I think this is part of what we want to do. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the question I ask so often, like, what is your body saying? Let's think yeah. about that. Uh, and if we, if we say, well, is it a distraction or is it a, a communication? We are missing the boat. It is both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this question here, a massage therapist told me one hip was higher than the other and my pelvis was off. So the recommended chiropractic, chiropractic usually helps, which was um, what you were told initially, um, but now there's more pain. Um, and so is it possible that there is a structural pain in the pelvis or is it still a mind body issue or, or is it potentially both. And so I don't know if you have, I guess, like boiled down that question is like, can there be structural issues that don't respond to mind body medicine, I think is what the question is. Okay, so I'm going to give I'm going to give what my take is. But, mm -hmm. you know, I encourage everybody to think about this for themselves. I'm not, I'm not the gospel. Um, but I do think what I say makes sense. Um, so the way I think about it is that injuries heal. If you have an injury, if you break a bone, generally the longest it takes to get better is 12 weeks uh, john you tell me but that's that's, yep, my understanding. that's about right yeah and so basically if you have a physical injury it should heal now if you have if you have an injury to one of your internal organs that doesn't heal uh, so it's interesting like my wife is is a uh, type 1 diabetic mm -hmm. her pancreas doesn't work there's nothing no mind body influence is going to change that you know and I think people, when they meet with me, they're very glad to hear me say things like that because they're like, oh, okay, you believe in reality. <laughs> uh, that's, and that's an important thing to establish. Um, but interestingly, my wife also can have low blood sugars when she doesn't want to be present. And she can have high blood sugars where insulin's not getting metabolized well if she's stressed. So the effect on physical issues is still very real. But I would say with respect to like a pelvic kind of thing, the studies are very conclusive that none of these structural abnormalities cause pain. And so my take is completely definitively, that's a mind body issue. Yeah. And I, um, you know, the pelvis, like that particular, like people tell me the leg length discrepancy or the pelvis is off or the SI joint is out of it. I have found that almost always those are mind body issues and not. Right. And, and I look, I think also if it was a structural issue, doctors really would catch it. I believe it. I believe in medicine. I, I do. I believe that they would understand if there was some issue like that. What I also believe though, is there's a lot of false positives yeah. and far more false positives than anything else. But generally speaking, if you've got a physical issue, doctors are going to catch it. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to start to wind down. Here's a really good question though. So it says much of this discussion has been around people with one main symptom. What about those of us who have many manifestations? I haven't had much luck with TMS. I'm doing DNRS. Um, haven't had much success with that. So many symptoms, trouble making the connection between symptoms and emotions or what's happening. What do we recommend for people who like, it's not, it's not just back pain. It's not just knee pain. It's just, it's all pain. Oh, wow. This is such a great question. I'm going to try yeah. to sum it up, but there's, there's a couple points to this. Yeah. First of all, most people don't have one symptom. Uh, that's what they talk about. That's what their focal point is. But when I had back pain, I had other things. I had headaches and I had irritable bowel stuff. And I, you, everybody's got multiple symptoms. So first of all, I wanted to kind of normalize that. Yeah. Secondly, um, I think that people with um, multiple symptoms, it just means the body's doing a lot of talking. You got a lot to say. And I don't think of it as really any different or more complicated or dooming or anything. It just means, wow, great. You're getting a lot of information. You know, like if you have fibromyalgia or, or been diagnosed with that, or you have chronic fatigue syndrome or, um, or let's say you have multiple, multiple things, you can treat multiple things. I treat multiple things every day. Um, I, you know, I think about this stuff a lot because it's what I do, but it's also because I need to get these questions answered, not just for me, but for all of you. So every symptom I have, I'm, I'm on it. And I have actually joked with people, and this is not a joke actually, but I sometimes pass it off as a joke. Um, I don't even sneeze without there being an emotional correlate. <laughs> you know, the phrase nothing to sneeze at, that comes from somewhere. Like, it's like I'm sitting there 
playing guitar and one of my daughters like daddy i need you for this and i'm like oh, i don't want to go you know we, we so it's really about letting in your emotional world and resolving your doubts if you can do those two things you can conquer a hundred symptoms at once and it could flow around it could be like oh god my shoulder hurts and my knee hurts and but they all have meaning it all makes sense and i wish i wish i had more time to say why that right. is yeah. But when I, when my book's out, it'll all be in there. When my podcast is out, I'll be, and yeah. hopefully I'll come back here or on all these things, but and and people who can contact me. I assume there's some way to get them my information. You know? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll have you do that in just a second. I just want to talk about this particular topic for one minute and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But, but I have found over time. So, um, so I have a handout on migraine headaches that I created a number of years ago. Like these are examples of migraine headaches and, this is, this is like what people experience and this is what people do about it. And this is how you can get better. And I was like, great. I wrote this handout. I'm just going to search and replace migraine headache with back pain and now I'll have a back pain handout. And so I did that and it made no sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, like migraines are different from back pain. Well, not only that, but migraines are different from back pain for multiple reasons. But one of them is the sufferer experiences them very differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I have found headaches are one of the hardest things to, to alleviate because it's so in your face. <laughs> it's, it's really right there. And you're like, how are you supposed to not? It's one thing to have neck pain and be like, mm -hmm. okay, I'll stop yeah. testing it and we'll just kind of yeah. go away. If you've got a pounding headache at, at a migraine level, that's grabbing your attention hugely. Yeah. And Although the, you and I, you and I will talk about that because I have had a lot of good luck with my patients with, with migraines. And so we'll awesome. talk about that. Awesome. Later. And you know, th this is the thing. We all have things to learn from each other. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think my, my topic of doubt, I can fill in some gaps for people and they're very important gaps, but I yeah. fill in my gaps. Yep. So yeah. I can't wait to talk about that. Yeah. And so, but anyway, so, so I, so that was one of my first lessons in, okay, like different symptoms mean different things for different people. We also did a study, Dr. Schubert and I started a study when I was in Michigan uh, with fibromyalgia patients. And it was my job to interview them about their trauma. And like, so I had this structured trauma handout and it's just like, they just kept telling me and telling me and telling me and telling me it was overwhelming. It was so overwhelming. It was like unspeakable. Cause I couldn't, like, I couldn't even figure out what to do with the yeah. data and we never published it. And so when I hear people are having pain over a wide area of their body, I know that that's at least a possibility is that there are some very significant things that may have happened to them. Yeah, over time. actually, I, I think not only that, but it's often a combination between a massive amount of emotional upheaval and trauma and experiences and the goodest personality, which we didn't mm -hmm. talk about much, but the, mm -hmm. the yeah. idea that people who want to help people so much and they're trying to be good that the combination between that and having suffered is very hard because those people and i was one of them for sure yeah don't let in the fullness of their suffering and i agree with you it's the ace study is a very important study to our absolutely work. and um you know essentially what it says is the more of it you have the more symptoms you're likely to have and i i really I, this is also really important i think about it in terms of racism or sexism mm -hmm. Racism, especially, I think there's real correlates where the fact that we, that um, a black person in America doesn't feel equal in a lot of ways and that the treatment that they get, it actually can physically affect them so much that we are essentially killing them. Mm -hmm. They die earlier. They mm -hmm. have higher disease rates. This is not their fault. Yeah. It is societal. Yeah. And yes, and, and so all of that fits in. And so to the person who asked that question and the other people who are, who are asking that question themselves, mm -hmm. it's about sometimes getting at some core issues that are very painful from way back. It's about being kind. Like that's one of the things that I always stress to people that when we get into this place where we feel like I failed because I'm not getting better, what you said is is true that they haven't failed. You and I have failed because we don't have the right information out there or we haven't created the program where people can talk with other therapists who understand this and can be compassionate and non-judgmental. And so to continue to look for the specific entry points 
in that that help people start to unlock this but it's not that people aren't doing the right thing it's that we haven't created the right information yeah for them. and and you know it, it it partially can be the failure of mind body people but also society at large is making it even yeah. worse uh, yeah. and yeah. so we're, we're up against it but we're, we're we're doing good work yeah so um it has been so delightful to have you here and talk with you and hear about your experience so if people want to contact you how can they connect with you um so uh, they they can reach me in my email which is dg ratner r-a-t-n-e-r at gmail.com um you you can text me if you want it's 718-412-1265 um but uh email is a really good entry point because it can allow me to I never, I'll never ignore anybody who contacts me. Even if I don't have a, a lot of time, I want to make sure they get where they need to go because I remember what that was like. So good. that's good. Cause you're going to get a lot of emails this week. So uh, <laughs> yeah. email, what's your email address one more time? D G R A T N E R at gmail.com. Great. And um, you know, I have lots of, I've, I've developed different levels. Like I actually have a PDF that's just like my basics of, of, TMS so that if they don't have time to meet with me or they can't afford me, I just send that to them. And then we move on to the next thing and, and people can get better from this at, in different ways. I've also trained people in what I do and I'm going to do that increasingly. So there needs to be more help and I'm, yeah. I'm working on it. So is John. Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and, and maybe we'll be working on it together. So and this, um, it, I hope so. And this really was a pleasure. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who's been here and listening and asking insightful questions and I know being supportive to each other on Facebook. And every time I do this, it just reminds me how touched I am to be part of this community of people who are working this hard in this brave and, and cutting edge way. And so um, as we sign off, just a reminder, telehealth options are available for me as well. You can get in touch with my website, www drstrax.com and my staff will get back to you with all the details. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, you can find the recording of this and all our previous episodes at Curable and My Hope for Healing webpage, which is curablehealth.com forward slash hope for healing. Uh, you can sign up for our office newsletter there and get updates about next episodes and everything else going on in my practice. I am headed out for vacation, um, not to East Hampton, but to uh, Northern Michigan. So I'll be gone for the next few weeks. We're going to record one of my patients, Jill, who had migraine headaches, and we'll post that while I'm gone. And then we'll be back live on Wednesday, September 9th, working hard on getting Dr. Elisa Batson as a guest. She's also a uh, curable medical advisor and a psychiatrist down in Nashville, Tennessee. And so um, until then, thanks everybody for watching. Dan, thanks so much for being here and sharing your wisdom Thank and you. your insight. You're welcome. Uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of their summer and continue to stay safe and be healthy. So good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>